Welcome to The Quarantine Tapes, a daily podcast from Onassis, L.A. and Dublin. Hosted by Paul Holden Graber, this series chronicles shifting paradigms in the era of social distancing. Hello. Hello. Can I please speak with uh, William Gibson? I think you have to. Bill, it's such a pleasure to have you on the line. Thank you well, so much for taking this call and for being part of the quarantine tapes. I really, really wanted to talk to you in these dire, difficult, and perhaps delirious times. Well, it's a, it's an absolute pleasure. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Well, thank you. Wherever here might mean, where does here mean for you now? Oh, dear. <laughs> I, ask, I ask myself that hourly, really. I mean, this is the, I, I keep trying to come up with equivalent experiences in my lifetime. And the only one that works at all for me, although this I sure would seem very strange, is the summer of 1967, because I think both these periods have a sort of, both, the, both those periods have, for me, a sort of super liminal quality from, you know, from day to day, one literally didn't know what to, what to expect. Not, not that they're similar in any other way, but those are the only two periods in my life where I simply, you know, I wake up in the morning and haven't a clue what's been happening while I've been asleep. And, you know, then, you know, I pick up my iPhone and find out and, you know, off again for another day of it. Take me, take me back to summer 1967. Well, I had I had gone to Toronto from my hometown in Virginia, having only a vague idea. I think that Canada was another country, <laughs> in you know in in that American way of looking at things. And I arrived at this in this city, which I had never really imagined. And I was intending hello hello I was intending. I was intending to go to eventually to San Francisco, and I thought I would hitchhike from Toronto to Vancouver. But I got there in March of '67, and it was, it was still a bit of snow and whatnot. And I started looking around, and I found myself in this remarkable city that I'd really scarcely heard of before, and. I hung around long enough for it to launch itself into its summer of 67. And right through the summer, uh, from one day to the next, I, I had absolutely no idea what was going to be happening to me or to the world. It, it uh, you know, it was just completely wide open. And this feels completely wide open to me, although it doesn't resemble my 1967 much at all. It certainly doesn't resemble the the uh, kitsch 1967 of, you know, nostalgia, cultural nostalgia. Well, what is so amazing to me is to hear you say that, because you've imagined so much the future. Um, you've always tried in some way or another, um, not maybe not to bring us closer to us to to the future, but to bring us to an understanding of what it might look so look like. So if you can't imagine it, what am I supposed to do? Well, I mean, uh, you know, and 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 I and I think you know of that wonderful line of Mark Twain, where he says it's difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. 
Yes, it, indeed. And, and I treasure that. I treasure that line. That's wonderful, actually. And I, I agree completely. There's a, a, a line of dialogue in Agency, my most recent novel, yes. where <clears throat> two characters who are in the 2070s, I think, are talking about 2017, the year 2017, and they're in, in touch with someone in 2017. And the wife says, oh, you know, I can't imagine that these people aren't continually happy, that nothing bad's really happened yet. And her husband says, well, it is just before the pandemics, and that's plural. <laughs> and it never gets the book, you know, the book never goes back to that. But I had pandemics on my my list of, of bad things we've been expecting for decades. So, I mean, what is what is so amazing uh, at this moment, and to hear you say it again adds to it, is that in my life, which is at this point not that short, it was short many years ago, but now it's become quite a bit longer. In my life, I've never experienced anything like this at all. Um, something so global, something, I mean, pandemic everywhere. <laughs> and it seems like it is nearly the only news we get now um, is this news of the pandemic. And what you once said that when you want to know how things really work, study them when they're coming apart. And I know it's a sentence you first read in Samuel Delaney, but I'm, I'm wondering, in studying what is happening now, things are certainly falling apart. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and uh, what do you see? What do you see as as truly um, imploding or exploding or however you might want to uh, express what, what this moment holds? Well, it, I mean, it's, um, it seems fractal in, in that regard. Like e everything... I, my biggest takeaway from it is that everything is indeed connected to everything else, and that particularly our our human culture is is so incredibly interconnected and interdependent in ways that we're not we're not ordinarily conscious of. So that when you when you have a global disruption on on this scale, the news every day is filled with countless large and small things that things that are connected that affect one another in ways that we we can't ordinarily we can't ordinarily be be aware of things as simple sometimes as as you know lines of sort of chains of commerce so that if things don't arrive at the ports in california they can't make it to walmart and so something that something that happened in china two months ago is causing an empty shelf Walmart in Kansas in, in this very direct but previously invisible way. And we sort of knew that that was the case, but to have it physically demonstrated to us, things like that, so many of them in, in so many in so many different different ways. Like who who would have guessed that the sinisterly long nasal swabs used to Testing for the coronavirus are only manufactured in Italy, and that that's you know that's causing a problem. I mean, the amount of information we're getting now 
about things like that, uh, these swabs made in Italy. It's extraordinary. And I'm, I'm you know, uh, I, I read you that line, when you want to know how things really work, study them when they're coming apart. And I know that this was posted on Twitter not long ago, and you see Twitter as a way to glance across the psychic state of the planet. In a, in a brief moment, in the morning, you get up, you might look at Twitter, and you will get, in, in matters of moments, a psychic feeling of what the a temperature of what the world yeah. might feel like. Yeah. And what's the temperature like now? Oh, I'd say it's fairly high. <laughs> <laughs> Boiling. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely running. It's definitely running the temperature. Sometimes I, I look at Twitter and try to imagine what it would be like minus the pandemic. And I think we'd be seeing a lot more and a lot worse global climate change news, which we are in fact seeing, but it's not, you know, not very much in the foreground at all. And that's all looking considerably worse even since since last year but we're not we're not we're not focused on that and i think i think in some way and i'm i'm not the first to say this so i can't remember where i first saw it this is the pandemic is a bit it, you could look at it as an opportunity to experience what will happen when the bad climate, the bad, the really bad aspects of climate change really start kicking in. And it will be, you know, be like the, the pandemic, but exponentially and unimaginably larger. Uh, and, and connected to this pandemic. I mean, it's all, all interconnected in ways that are... Uh, uh, in in a way, where that part was predictable. Well, yes, and apparently, I mean, it seems to me that all of the things that were really, yeah, you know, all of all of these ominous things that have been lurking in the wings now for years, decades, uh, they are all anthropogenic. Right. They're all things caused by humankind. All of the things that we're really frightened of in the world today are, are the are the result of human beings doing things that they really had no idea would ever be doing any ever be doing any harm. The, these these pandemics in a sense. I've read are are the result of how we live with animals and how we live. In, more of us live increasingly closer to wild animals that human beings previously had relatively little contact with. Has has your interpretation of your past writings? changed over the past decades? Have your early works, as it were, taken on new and unforeseen meanings in light of recent events? I know that you, you've you spoken about the interpretive fallacy, and it's something that interests me greatly also. Um, having studied a hundred years ago comparative literature, yeah. it's something that, that, you know, is is William Gibson a better interpreter of his own work. I mean, all of this is, is interesting and, and we could explore it at great lengths, but what's happening now has had such an effect that I'm wondering when you look back or when you, when, either when you look back or when you think back, um, is there a change in the way you, you think about your, your own long career, which has had such an, an impact? Well, when I'm in, 
when I when I look back and I don't <clears throat> ordinarily look back at my own work very frequently and I, I've had to I've had to over the past couple of years because there's been talk of doing doing adaptations like screen and television version, versions of things. And I've had to go back and, and look at the original text and say, you know, what looking looking for things really that are dated and you know, wondering, you know, how those could be how those could be interpreted, say, for a, tele, a television series. And I didn't, overall, I don't think I, I did too badly. <laughs> and, and I've, in, you know, in, in that sense, there are things that one cannot, you know, you know, one can, no one can really predict what's really going to happen. I mean, the, the best I, it's always felt to me that I was hedging my bets and being vague where it suited me strategically and building in sort of, you know, a pyramid of, of, nar of, of narrative of some kind. But there, from the beginning there in my work, there was a sense of a sense of the natural world having been disrupted. It's not discussed, but for instance, in Neuromancer, there's a, a glancing mention, someone they're walking through a, a, a broken down palace in Istanbul, and, and they come to a stuff, there's a stuffed horse, a taxidermy horse, and there's this brief discussion about the pandemic that killed all the horses and it's never it's never mentioned it, it's it's never mentioned again but it's just this odd little little thing and and i've i've always had those the uh, you know cities L that little glimpses uh, well little hints that something something's gone wrong but that people have gotten Basically, they've gotten used to it. But something has gone wrong for a long time. Yeah, something's I mean, gone wrong for a long, long time. time. So it's, not, it's not as though the problem emerged in the last 10 years. It's, yeah. It, it, one, one could, I'm, I, I think in Gibson's terms, one could imagine that it's gone, long, gone wrong for, let us say, a century. Yeah, uh, yes, and... That is, I think that that's the result of my having decided with regards to science fiction and, and you know, some years before I ever began to, to try to write it, that one of the failings of American science fiction was that it seemed to be set in a sort of perpetual present in that the the future in American science fiction really didn't, see, really didn't seem to have any past, whereas the European science fiction, there was always a, a sense of the past. And I decided that was because Europeans live among, yeah, within, in Europe, one lives within the past. It's right. still there. You can the buildings are there. You can walk out and 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 see it. See it every day. You're you're never away from it. Whereas in America, early, you know, in the 1940s, when a lot of the science fiction I read as a child was written, uh, there was if if you got tired of the present, you moved west. And built right go built west, go new... west my boy uh, it, it's yeah. true but you know and, and i i may have said this to you before but even after three and more decades of living in this country and i think not quite having gotten rid of my accent i am still so amazed by the american english way of 
speech when you say that's history and that means that's irrelevant i mean it's it's over, it's over but it, it i mean you couldn't for the life of any language translate it into any other if you said in french c'est de l'histoire they would say histoire de quoi history of what um, it, so, it, in the English language saying, in the English-American language saying that's history means it doesn't matter anymore. Yeah, they, they, there is a, isn't it? There's a passage in pattern recognition that I'd, I'd love you, love to read to you because I think in many ways for you to interpret it much in the way that I was asking you to think about the whole notion of interpretive fallacy might might become interesting. You say, we have no idea now of who or what the inhabitants of our future might be. In that sense, we have no future, not in the sense that our grandparents had a future or thought they did. Fully imagined cultural futures were the luxury of another day, one in which now was of some greater duration. For us, of course, things can change so abruptly, so violently, so profoundly that futures like our grandparents have insufficient now to stand on. We have no future because our present is too volatile. We have only risk management, the spinning of the given moment scenario, pattern recognition. How does this strike you in this reading at this moment on this day well now that you bring it up it strikes me to be quite descriptive of now. of the present of the present moment yeah and uh, our our now has become briefer in the past three months than I would have imagined it possible. I was in London at the end of, of my novel tour on what they were calling Brexit Eve. It was, you know, the, like the last night before Brexit happened in whatever sense Brexit ever ever happened and i was very jet lagged and exhausted and i'd been traveling for weeks and i went out and wandered around then and, and found myself in leicester square just sort of stunned by it's a mood there was, there was something going on it felt to me like the end of something but i couldn't I couldn't quite believe that that simply that it was simply the end of pre -bre the pre Brexit era. It felt it, it felt much bigger. And when I think of that now, it feels like for me that was when the now shortened because I, I had been watching the coronavirus outbreak in Italy out of the corner of my eye and I've been busy with a lot of other things but I, there was, I had some sense of something was something very significant was was happening and somehow that I will I think I'll always remember that evening as somehow my first awareness of, of the now shortening even more because if you told if someone from from now had told me and that that evening, <laughs> what was going, you know, what was happening for, for them, uh, I, it would have been hard for me to believe, you know, we're, we're, we've come that far in, in such an in incredibly such a short, short, yeah, I think it, it, yeah. it will have huge, uh, huge effects, I mean, it already does have huge effects on our psyche in ways that we, we can't even quite imagine. I know you are a fan of uh, Umberto Eco's essay, yeah. Ur Fascism, and um, Carlo Ginzburg, an extraordinary Italian historian, said that fascism has a future. And I, I'm wondering if you, if you think that term can aptly be used 
at the present time? Well, I use it. I use it myself in my own inner inner dialogue, and the that really is is because my my favorite professor of English literature while I was an undergraduate had made his his central study of English literature was around the mass psychology of fascism. So uh, who, who I was, who was that? Who was he, um, Dr. John Doheny at uh, the University of British Columbia. And he, he introduced me to uh, Hannah Arendt's work and to uh, other, other texts of fascism. I don't think, I think that was prior... Prior to Echo's essay. Yes. Yeah, to Echo's, Would have been. Echo, Echo's essay. But he introduced me to the, he introduced me to, to the, the idea that rather than being some incredibly exotic, uh, almost magically wicked, super evil, extreme uh, human condition, that fascism was something that, that all of us carry the roots of. At, at all times, that that's what's dangerous about it. That it it uh, it runs on human hard human hardwiring. So it's never its potential is never going going to go go away. It's and never, never it, far away. Yeah, it's never far away. And one of the one of the things that convinced me of that when I, when I was studying that stuff was that I found the the mass psychology of, of fascism to to account for a fair amount of my own experience in the '60s counterculture. So, or, uh, and I could I could also see it going on, you know, going going on in in conservative governments at the time and whatnot. But where I could really see it going on was in 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 the in the counterculture. In places every, you wouldn't in places you wouldn't imagine it existing. No. Every every commune, not that I visited that many, but every commune <laughs> I ever went to, there was this pong of fascism. There would be like one guy, and it was always a guy who was like uh, the leader. And if you look at like Manson's Manson's operation was just a, a super pure version of of that. And and yeah I and mean, you know I, and I, I still I still think that it's not a very uh pop it's not a very popular view among people people well, it, by own, well, own it, age who experience that stuff it, it, matter, it, it matters little that it's popular it matters yeah. that it's right um uh, you know and I I wish I wish, Bill, we, we, we had more time to talk because one of the things I would have loved to talk to you about is um, delusional mass crowd behavior, yes. uh, which would have been fantastic. But sadly, I must bid you farewell and, and send you a virtual hug. I, yes, uh, and I, I'm, I'm hoping that we will see each other in person soon. I hope so. I hope so, too. Even... Even seeing you on my iPhone has it's, been a wonderful it, treat. And for me too, it's been the first time that I've had one of these phone calls and seen my interlocutor, but seeing you really makes me very joyous. So, Bill, a huge hug to you. Well, it's very mutual. And but, be well. Be well. Take good care. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. To support this show and Dublab's progressive programming, Go to dublab.com slash support.